I've entitled this message The Twelve Sons of Jacob. I've never preached on this before, and I hope I have some help in doing so. When the high priest went into the Holy of Holies once a year, not without blood, he had a breastplate over his heart with the name of the twelve sons of Jacob written. He also had on his shoulder the twelve sons of Jacob written, six on each shoulder. They were near to his heart, the place of his love. He carried them on his shoulders. Throughout the Old Testament, God's people are called the house of Jacob. God is called by the name the God of Jacob more than any other title in the scripture. A lot of significance to that. The God of Jacob. Jacob himself is mentioned almost twice more than Abraham, and who knows how much more than Isaac. If you look at the book of Genesis, there are 14 chapters dedicated to Abraham. There are two or three chapters with Isaac, and there are 25 chapters with the life of this man, Jacob. God refers to his people as Jacob. In Psalm 24, 6, we read these words, These are the generations of those who seek thy face, O Jacob. Christ is called Jacob. This speaks of the union between Christ and his Jacobs. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, we read, I am the Lord. I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God said two times, once in the Old Testament, once in the New, Jacob have I loved. And you know, that wouldn't mean a whole lot unless we read the rest of that verse. Esau have I hated. God's love for Jacob. Now, the sons of Jacob represent the church, the people of God, every believer, and their names actually tell us what a believer is. And I hope by the end of this message, you and I will know what a believer is, what a Christian is, what a saint is. Now, the story of their birth is bizarre. I've thought about entitling this message, The Birth Wars, because that is pretty much what is going on. You can't help but feeling sorry for Leah, verse 31 of chapter 29. And when the Lord saw that Leah was hated. Now remember, Leah was the older sister of Rachel. Rachel was beautiful. Leah was not. And you remember the story of what took place last week if you were here. Well, Leah conceived, verse 32, and bare a son. She called his name Reuben. My marginal reading says, see a son. Behold, a son. For she said, surely the Lord hath looked upon mine affliction. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. I feel sorry for her, don't you? She was doing everything she could to gain her husband's affection. 
And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Because the Lord hath heard that I was hated, he hath therefore given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Hearing. And she conceived again and bare a son and said, Now this time will my husband be joined unto me because I born him three sons. Therefore was his name called Levi, joined. And she conceived again and bare a son. And she said, Now will I praise the Lord. Therefore she called his name Judah and left bearing. She quit having children. She has four kids now, all by Leah. Well, Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children. Rachel envied her sister. Now you put yourself in her place. She was barren. Her sister was having all the children. And as a matter of fact, she got the high honor of having Judah. That's the line Christ came through. But she envied her sister Leah. You know, whatever situation somebody's in, the other person has it better. And that's how she felt it. That's the way she felt about things. And she said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. And Jacob's anger was kindled against Rachel. And he said, am I in God's stead? Who hath withheld from thee the fruit of the womb? He's saying, the Lord's the reason you don't have a child. What do you get mad at me for? What are you expecting something out of me? And she said, behold, my maid, Billa. Now that's the same thing that Sarah did with Hagar, remember? Same thing. Was it right? No. Did they do it? Yes. Behold, my maid Billa, go in unto her, and she shall bear upon my knees that I may also have children by her. And she gave him Billa, her handmaid to wife, and Jacob went in unto her, and Billa conceived and bare Jacob a son. And Rachel said, God hath judged me, and hath heard my voice, and hath given me a son. Therefore called she his name Dan, or judgment. And Billah, Rachel's maid, conceived again and bare Jacob a second son. And Rachel said, with great wrestlings have I wrestled with my sister, and I have prevailed. And she called his name Naphtali. She thought, I'm up on her now. Well, when Leah saw that she had left bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid, and gave her Jacob to wife. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a son. And Leah said, a troop cometh. She called his name Gad. And Zilpah, Leah's maid, bare Jacob a second son. And Leah said, Happy am I, for the daughters will call me blessed. And she called his name Asher. So here we have four from Leah, two each from the handmaids. Verse 14, And Reuben went into the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field. Anybody know what mandrakes are? They're called love apples. It was an aphrodisiac, so they thought. They thought this is what is, she thought this is going to enable me to have more children. And that's what mandrakes were. Now, did they have that effect? Probably not, but they believe they did. And Reuben went into the days of wheat harvest and found mandrakes in the field and brought them in to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, Give me, I pray thee, of thy son's mandrakes. And she said unto her, Is it a small matter that thou hast taken my husband? Wouldst thou take away my son's mandrakes also? And Rachel said, Therefore he shall lie with thee tonight for thy son's mandrakes. Isn't that bizarre? I mean, you read stories like this and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, well, I'm just going reading. <laughs> and Jacob came out of the field in the evening. I guess he'd been working all day. And Leah went out to meet him and said, Thou must come in unto me, for surely I've hired thee with my son's mandrakes. <laughs> Can you imagine that? And he lay with her that night. And God hearkened unto Leah, and she conceived and bare Jacob the fifth son. And Leah said, God hath given me my hire because I've given my maiden to my husband. And she called his name Issachar. And Leah conceived again and bare Jacob the sixth son. And Leah said, God hath endued me with a good dowry. Now will my husband dwell with me. 
because I bore him six sons and she called his name Zebulun, a dwelling place. And afterwards she bare a daughter and called her name Dinah. And God remembered Rachel and God hearkened to her and opened her womb. She prayed about this. She asked the Lord for this. And the Lord answered her. The Lord answers prayer. He is called, O thou that hearest prayer. She prayed about this. It grieved her in her heart. And the Lord answered her prayer. And she conceived and bare a son and said, God hath taken away my reproach. And she called his name Joseph. Added is what his name means. Added. And said, the Lord shall add to me another son. And some years later, she has another son by the name of Benjamin. And you will remember the blatant favoritism that Jacob has to the two sons of Rachel much more above the other ten sons. Now, these 12 boys, these 12 men, are the men that were written on the breastplate of the great high priest. And they were held up by his shoulders. And listen to what the scripture says, God says of Jacob. God hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob. Neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. Now, God sees things as they really are. I want me and you to understand that because we don't see things that way. It's impossible for us to see things that way. But that is how God sees. And how God sees is as it is. Oh, the gospel that makes this so. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ makes it to where God who can see. Oh, nothing gets past him. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, nor seen perverseness in Israel. Now, through the names of these 12 sons of Jacob, we can learn something about what a believer is. Now, Reuben. We feel sorry for Leah at this time, but now she has a son. God hearkened to her. God had mercy on her, and she named that son Reuben. And his name means, behold, a son. See, a son. And my dear friends, this is what a believer is. He's someone who beholds the son. He sees the son. Listen to the scripture from John chapter 5, verse 40. The Lord said, this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone that seeth the son and believeth on him hath everlasting life. Now, here's what comes first. Seeing him. And I'm not talking about a physical sight. You find out, you see, you perceive who he is. And that's what faith is. Faith is seeing who he is. You can't trust a Christ if you don't know who he is. You can't believe on a Christ that you don't know who he is. Faith begins right here. It's seeing who he is. Like the thief. I think the thief is the most glorious illustration of this. When he went to that cross first, he didn't know who he was. He had no idea who Christ was. He was cursing with his buddy. But all of a sudden, by the revelation of God, he knew who Jesus Christ was. That's why he said, Lord, 
remember me. He knew who he was. And I guarantee you this, if you know who he is, you will call on his name. If you know who he is, you will trust him. Behold, a son. See, a son. If I see who he is, I will trust him. That's what a believer is. He's someone who sees the son. You know, there are multitudes in Lexington, Kentucky right now who are very religious, but they have no idea about this thing of beholding the glory of the Son. They see no beauty in him. They see no perfection in him. But a believer does. We see that he is all our salvation, and we trust him. Now, the second boy's name is Simeon. His name means hearing. You don't see with your eyes, you see with your ears. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not heard? Be swift to hear, slow to speak. You see, you can't hear while you're talking. You cannot hear while you're talking. The only way you can hear is if you're hearing. You know, it's faith cometh by hearing. What, what we're doing right now, sitting there listening to what's being said from God's word. His name means hearing. Keep thy foot when thou goest into the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear and your soul shall live and I'll make an everlasting covenant with you even the sure mercies of David. A believer is one who sees with their ears hearing the gospel. And you know, hearing is about the most passive thing you do. Yes, you think about it and so on, but you just sit there and listen to what is said. That's not works, is it? That's just sitting there listening, hearing. He that hath ears to hear. How many times did the Lord say that? He that hath ears to hear. Do you have ears to hear? If you do, he gave them to you. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear here. Now, the third son's name was Levi. And you'll notice that she said, now will my husband be joined to me. What Levi means is joined. Joined. The two become one flesh. And this is what every believer is joined to Christ eternally united to Christ, one with him. So that what he does, I do. It's more than what he does is credited to my account. What he does, I do. Now that's part of the great mystery of the gospel. You remember when the Lord said to John the Baptist, thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. When Jesus Christ kept God's holy law, there's a whole lot of other people who did as well. I fulfilled all righteousness when he did. Hebrews 2.11 says, um, both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. For the which cause? He's not ashamed to call them brethren. He looks at me and he's not ashamed to own me as his brother because I'm one with him. I think maybe uh, one of the clearest illustrations of this is found in Hebrews chapter 7. Now, the very message, the heart and soul of the gospel is what he did, I did. When he kept the law, I kept the law. When he died, I died with him. I was judged with him. When he was raised from the dead, 
I was raised from the dead. As he's right now seated in heaven, the scripture says we're seated together with him. Now look here in Hebrews chapter 7. Verse 9, And as I may so say, Levi also, who received tithes, paid tithes in Abraham. Now Levi wasn't born. It does not say when, this is when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. It doesn't say that Abraham's tithe paying is credited to, to Levi's account, does it? Remember, every word is exact in Scripture. God says it just as it, he would have it said. It says Levi paid tithes when his great-grandfather did it. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. Now, union with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's my hope. That's a, really, this is, in, in some respects, this is the biggest truth in Scripture, that I'm united to him, that God views me and God sees things as they are as having kept the law because I'm united to the Lord Jesus Christ. He won with him. And, and the uh, vine and the branches Lord said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. I love this. The same stem that's in the vine goes through the branches with no connecting point. This is talking about the eternal union of Jesus Christ with his people. Just believe. It's what the Bible teaches. Just believe. United to the Lord Jesus Christ. And Judah. The Lord came through Judah and his name means praise. Jacob said at the end, when he's talking about his boys, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't deceived concerning his boys. He said all kinds of horrible things about him there in chapter 49 and 50 when he's talking about his 12 boys. They were sinners. They were, they were in many respects, they were very bad people. And you can read the, the scripture gives this history of these men, these men. But Jacob says to Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. And my dear friends, that's what we're doing right now, isn't it? We are praising the Lord Jesus Christ. He gets all the glory and salvation, and we love it that way. Oh, we love the lion of the tribe of Judah who came up to the throne, and the Scripture says he took the book. He didn't ask for it. He took it as the Father's equal. Oh, what praise goes to Judah. And we're praising him right now. Now, Paul put it this way, God forbid that I should glory, that I should have confidence in, that I should rest in, that I should have hope in anything save the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. So Leah quits bearing at that time, and that's when Rachel has her handmaids go in unto Jacob. And the first one's name was Dan. You can read about that in Genesis 30, verses 1 through 6. His name means judge or judgment. And what this is speaking of is the absolute justice of our salvation. Now, what do I mean by that? I want to show you two scriptures. Turn to John chapter 5. While you're turning there, Revelation 19.8 says, Unto her was granted fine linen, clean and white. This is the righteousness of the saints. It doesn't say the righteousness of Christ imputed to the saints, although it is. It says this is the personal righteousness of the saints. The righteousness of Jesus Christ is my personal righteousness. And the justice of God demands my salvation. The law of God demands my salvation. Now look here in Luke or John chapter 5.
verse 27. And he hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the son of man. Marvel not at this for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. This is talking about the final resurrection. And shall come forth. Now look at this statement. They that have Christ's righteousness imputed to them under resurrection of life. Doesn't say that, does it? They that have done good. They that have done good. Unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil, unto the resurrection of damnation. If Christ is my righteousness, I have done good and will be rewarded accordingly. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body, things in body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, this is used by uh, religious people uh, who don't understand the gospel to teach what they call the beam of judgment. This is a judgment after the judgment. First you have the great white throne judgment and after that you have the judgment where you're going to receive what you've done in your body, whether it's good or bad. I mean, some are going to have uh, big mansions and drive Cadillacs and some are going to be living in the slums. You're going to receive according to what you've done. You're going to be rewarded according to your works. That's evil. I don't know what else to call it. That's evil. The righteousness of Christ is mine so much that what I've done in my body is good. And the very justice and law and judgment of God demands the salvation of everybody Christ died for. Now, that's good. That's good. The, just, the judgment of God and then the next son that she has is Naphtali. You can read about him in Genesis 37 and 8. And his name means wrestling. Wrestling. Now this person who is justified before God wrestles. And that's talking about the wrestle always happening between the old and the new nature. It is nonstop. It is continual. It will not cease until we die and put down this old nature. You can read about it in Romans chapter 7. Every believer has two separate natures. And you really can't uh, determine, well, that was done by the good, the, the holy nature. It's not like that. We talked about this last Wednesday night, but it's, it's very much like hot water and cold water coming out of the same faucet. Uh, different, different, but they come out of the same consciousness of a man. So there's a wrestling going on. And listen to this scripture from Song of Solomon, chapter 6, verse 13. What will you see when you see the Shulamite? Now the Shulamite is the bride, the one Christ rejoiced over and said, you've ravished me with one of your eyes. Uh, you're all fair, my love. There's no spot in thee. What will you see when you see the Shulamite? As it were, the company of two armies. That's in the Song of Solomon. Speaking of Christ's relationship with his church, even then you see a company of two armies. <clears throat> to deny two separate natures in a believer, for one thing, if you do that, you're saying you've got your old nature. You've got the nature you're born with. That's trouble. That's trouble because the carnal mind is enmity against God. 
And if you deny two separate natures, you deny what total depravity is. It says the flesh is totally evil and cannot be improved. It can't be made good. Uh, you have to have a new nature that was not there before. That's what the new birth is. It's a new nature. But every believer has this struggle with two natures. But I think this is really glorious. The next uh, person that's mentioned is Gad. And his name means to overcome. <laughs> you may have a battle going on, but I know who's going to win. Greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. And what is the victory? This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the victory. I hate it when I hear preachers, or not only preachers, I've heard other people, I'm living a defeated Christian life. There ain't no such thing. Not if you're a believer. You're victorious in Christ Jesus. You're more than conquerors through him that loved you. Gad, the victor. Asher, his name means happy. Happy. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his refuge. Happy is he. And this happiness doesn't mean giddy. You might be in a situation of great sorrow for who knows what reason. There are so many reasons. But even in the midst of sorrow, we know this, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. I love what Paul said to Agrippa when he's there in those chains, standing before that heathen king. He says, I think myself happy, O oh Agrippa. Long as God's on the throne, I have every reason to be happy, to know something of the joy and the peace of believing. There's joy in a believer's life. Somebody said to me once, I got joy in my life. And I thought, well, why do you got to tell me? But there is joy in the believer's life. Happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his refuge. Issachar means recompense or reward. That's after she uh, bought him for the mandrakes. And she said that I've now got my recompense or my reward. To every believer, Christ says, I am thy exceeding great reward. <laughs> what a reward. And it's a just reward. We've already seen that. It's a just reward because of justification. I am thy exceeding great reward. The very righteousness of God demands our salvation. And then Zebulun, the tenth, his name means a dwelling place. A dwelling place. Didn't the Lord say, in my Father's house are many mansions. And the word is literally dwelling places. Uh, we think a big, you know, how, how many square feet and stuff when we think of a mansion. That doesn't have anything to do with it. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. And what is the dwelling place of the believer? It's to abide in Christ. Amen. Now, what does that mean? That means at all times there's only one place I want to be found in Christ. At all times. Under no circumstance do I ever want to be viewed independently of Jesus Christ. I want all God to see is Jesus Christ. And there's a conscious desire to want to stay there. I don't want to be, I don't want to be judged in any way. If thou shouldst mark iniquities, O Lord, who should stand? I simply want to be found in Christ so that when God looks at me, he sees his son. And that is all he sees. And every believer has a strong desire for that. Like Paul said, oh, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faithfulness of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Joseph means added. The Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. 
If you're by his grace a saved individual, you know why? The Lord added you to the church. And I love the way it says such as should be saved. You see, everybody that Christ died for should be saved because he paid for their sins. They have no sin. And additions. Now, I realize the universal church doesn't get bigger, doesn't get smaller. It's got the names of God's elect in the Lamb's book of life. But don't we love in this life to see additions, the Lord adding to the church daily, such as should be saved. Benjamin, the last man, he means son of my right hand. Son of my right hand. We, we started with see a son. Remember that? Behold a son, see a son. And we end up with the son at the right hand of the father and all that means. My hope of salvation right now is that he is seated at the right hand of the Father having completed salvation seated ruling and reigning in the place of all authority. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. That's good hope isn't it? So the twelve sons of Jacob, sinful men without doubt, but behold a son. Hearing, joined to. Praise, judgment, wrestling, overcome. Happy, recompense, dwelling place, adding, the son of the right the gospel. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the gospel of thy son. How we thank you for giving us eyes to see your son, ears to hear your gospel. Lord, how we thank you for eternal union with Christ. How we thank you for him who is to be praised. Lord, how we thank you for his representing all your people even now at your right hand. And Lord, we look forward to his return when he comes in glory where every eye will see him. And Lord, until that time comes, we ask that you would enable us to walk with him by faith to rest in him, to trust him, to love him supremely and completely, oh, that we might be found in him. As we look, face this coming week, we ask that you would keep us. We ask for the salvation of those you bring us into contact with, that we might be able to preach the gospel. We pray for our children, that you would reveal yourself to them. Thank you for Christ. In his name we pray.